So here we go. So we're live now, huh? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord. He'll start to he'll start to reveal some of it. So we want to just join everybody, so, or help say hello to everybody who is joining um, here. This is Kingdom Enlightenment. We're going to be talking about power and authority for revival and kingdom reformation. So come on in, come on in, come on in. And I'm going to probably need to stand up for this <laughs> walk a little bit. So I think first I want to I want to read something to you. This is a book that I love very, very much. It's called Visions from Heaven, Visions of Heaven, is by John Tisdale. And I don't typically go to books repeatedly. Once I read it, I'm pretty much done. But this is a short book, but it was so impactful to my life and opened my eyes in so many ways that there are times I go back and I refer to it because he's talking about, and he actually is in this, uh, he goes to Launch Houston. Um, he's a part of the, that ministry, which we are aligned with Launch Houston, and um, wow. for those of you guys, that know, some people think that we are Launch Houston, we're not, we're <laughs> Kingdom Enlightenment, but that's our alignment, our apostolic alignment, so we're here out of this building, and um, but he actually goes to Launch, and so he wrote this amazing book, and I literally had to take my time to go through it because of all the revelation that I would get when I was reading it, so I'm actually going to read this to you, and this is how we're going to start, so one of the most significant visions of heaven I've had was a throne room experience around 2000. During a time of prayer, I suddenly found myself standing before the throne of God. And you can get this on Amazon, by the way. What I witnessed were the four living beings or the seraphim, meaning burning ones, hovering above the Father as he sat upon his throne, Revelations 4. They were covered in eyes all over their bodies and wings. Y'all remember that? In Revelation, they were covered with, with eyes all over their body and their wings. With them, they held the Father. They beheld the Father as they hovered over him. So they're just watching him, beholding him. Their nearness to him, combined with their numerous eyes, gave them the ability to gaze upon the deeper regions of his person. What seemed apparent from watching them was that their array of eyes had various capabilities as to so as to allow them to behold different aspects of the father's person so they had all these different eyes and each of those eyes beheld a different aspect of who god was i got the impression that some acted like magnifying lenses that probed the intricate details of the fabric of his being others could discern other eyes could discern things from a great distance so metaphorically, it was as if some of their eyes could see infrared while others could behold ultraviolet wavelengths of light, if you want to give it you know, that kind of thing. The summation of their eyes allowed them to see anything pertaining to his nature and character. I understood that by design, nothing was hidden from their all-seeing gaze. It seemed the Father specifically granted to them the ability to gaze upon the infinite mysteries of his identity. An impression I got from watching them was that their purpose was to search the vast depths of this person and report to the inhabitants of heaven their discoveries. So they're supposed to see all these things and report it back to the other people, the other inhabitants of heaven, also people, and how there's a lot of different spiritual beings in heaven. Uh, you know, because the seraphim is different creatures, right? Um, and I think Ezekiel saw some other ones that looked a little different than these. So whatever they discovered, they were allowed to proclaim to those present in his throne room. They were able to announce it. In essence, they flew over him like satellites hovering over the surface of the earth, taking photos and sending them back to the planet. In essence, they not only scanned the surface, but their eyes could penetrate into the depths of his being. It was as if the father wanted a system in place that allowed his creation to gaze into his innermost parts and know his defining characteristics. So he created these beings with just such capacity as well as the ability to inform all others of their all-seeing discoveries. I watched these four living beings as they gazed with focused intentionality into the Father's being. 
Glimpses of what they saw filled my spirit. The best words I can find to describe what I saw was like looking into an infinite ocean filled with liquid jewels. Oh my God. One such jewel described a part of his goodness when they focused on this jewel and they were flooded with realization of that his goodness was far pure, bigger, richer than what they previously imagined possible. So I'm going to go here a little bit down. So here's something else. Next, I saw the, the seraphim gazing into regions of the Father's person that revealed new insights into his humanity. And um, once again, they were, they were declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord all, God Almighty. They were saying no words are capable of truly describing the reality of his person. Nothing exists to which God can be compared. He is altogether different and higher than anything capable of being defined. The depths of his, humani of hu of his humility are unfathomable. Words cannot do his humanity, humility, sorry, justice. Therefore, they declare his traits to be without adequate definition or comparison. I realized that this cycle had been going on throughout heaven since ancient eons past. Like they continue to do this. Here's the part that's important. I'm trying to see where he goes there. They never find a, uh, they, so they'll never quite fully understand him. Um, one, and I'm not going to continue reading because it's, there's eight pages, but one thing I'm going to say about this is in their searching of God and they're going back and telling people what they saw, the thing that stood out to me the most was that they would come back every time and say, wait a minute, there's a deeper revelation than what we saw the last time. And they would go back and explain it even more. So I want people to understand this is what it's like when it comes to moves of God. This is what it's like when it comes to moves of God. God will reveal himself in movements. And you just start seeing revival sweeping the nation or cities or, or people groups because he's revealing some aspect of him and opening up heaven where they are. And there's a revival that's been prophesied. I've said this many times before. That's been prophesied of about 100 years ago that it would happen in 100 years. We're now in the time where God is starting to revive people. He's starting to revive the land. He chose Houston. Houston actually was supposed to house Azusa Street. But more, it was C. William Seymour. Seymour ended up, because of, uh, uh, because of racism and stuff like that, he ended up going to California. And Azusa Street happened there, on Azusa Street. So it would have been something else here. But God wanted to do it here. So God hasn't forgotten about us. And God has been making preparation. He actually wants Houston to be a place of revival. And he's been preparing. Because a lot of people are saying, well, the 100 years has already happened. So where is it? God is preparing in a different way. This, this revival is supposed to be sustainable. It's not supposed to come and go like revivals past. Is very similar to, um, and I'm kind of going into my notes, but it's very similar to another revival that happened in the 1500s, which is the breaking away from the, the Catholic Church to where now we see the reform, Reformation of the Protestants. We see Protestants now. There are people that, these are people that broke away. So we're asking, why are there all these religions? And why are there all these denominations? For a season, denominations was not a bad thing. Denominations are different expressions. Now we're not a denomination, but denominate because there was another movement that came and said, okay, let's get a little bit more clear than that, because now it's putting us back in a religious box, just like Catholicism did. Religion was basically like the Baptists had a different way of expressing worshiping God. They had a different revelation. The Church of Christ, the Pentecostal Church, all of them had different revelations. They all had different. These are people groups that that accepted different parts of the Lord movements happen like that so unfortunately um unfortunately we would all look at each other and say oh you don't have what we have and the baptists are like y'all ain't as deep in the word mm -hmm. and the pentecostals are like yeah but you're not as deep in the spirit you know or the holiness church or whatever they all had different understandings but as you can see it's not the fullness but what god has been saying in his word is i want ephesians 1 he's saying I want to. I want us to walk in the fullness. So now he's ha he has us in more of an apostolic reformation. Come on in. Come on in. He has us now in an apostolic reformation. That's going to be doing something different. So I'm going to go ahead and get into my lesson because I've actually jumped around on you. So. <laughs>
Here's a come on, Davida. That's my friend Davida, y'all. <laughs> okay, so here we go. The basis of shaping culture and understanding the move of God we are in is to understand the language. Each move of God has a little bit different language. So God is wanting to reform language because sometimes religion will attach to language, good language, and corrupt it. And whenever you say it, it's like, eh. So when people say discipleship, we think of, you're going to sit me in a, some classroom, and it's going to be boring, and you're going to just tell me about water baptism and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, but that is not the wholeness of what discipleship at all. It's like just some foundational stuff. Discipleship means I'm going to learn from Christ. It's not something that you do one time. It's something that you continue to do. And not only am I going to learn from him, but I have to also learn from him, not just what's in the Bible. Sorry, I'm taking that back. It's always in the Bible. Not just what somebody reads to me in a book telling me what discipleship is. It's also an experience with the Lord that needs to accompany with the word of God. So some, some places are heavy on the word, some are heavy on experience. The charge of this particular house, this community, this ministry, is to bring a balance to both. We need both. We need strong word, but we need equally strong um, ways of expressing and experiencing God and searching out the mysteries of God. We're not afraid to search out the mysteries thinking you're going to fly off somewhere and you're not going to understand stuff. Because people are already having experiences and nobody's there to explain it to them. And I know I went through some hell to, uh, to understand the spirit realm. So look, <laughs> I'm not the only one, but I'm just saying, I'm not going to hold back. I'm like, you got questions? Let's figure this thing out. Let's talk to the Lord. Sometimes you need someone to prophetically counsel you and just take a journey with you as you're talking and walking through some things so you can understand. God wants us to search out the deep mysteries of who he is. Just like he, just like he created these seraphim or burning ones. We too are burning ones that are beholding who he is. We too are like those seraphim that are flying around in our realm of influence, revealing aspects of God that he's revealed to us. And people say, well, I don't know how to disciple anybody. Whatever you have, give it to somebody else. You don't have to have everything. That's why we're a body. Send them to somebody else. Sometimes people send people to me. Sometimes I send people to other people. I'm like, oh, this lady, she knows more about, you know, spiritual mapping. She's probably good for, I think of her all the time because that's an area I wanted to do wanted to get into, but I just don't have the time. There's so many other things in the kingdom to learn about. But I know somebody, I know a couple people that's great at that. Um, you need a prophet, a strong prophet who's been around. She's the one in that room over there. She's working right now. It was awesome. But anyway, I love her. <laughs> like, infinitely love her. So here's, and I'm going to talk to you guys about power and authority a little bit. I know we talked about this like at the end of January, but I'm going to give it to you again because uh, from a different perspective. So what is power? And we, you know, Luke 10, 17 through 20 is one of my favorite scriptures to explain it because of the way it's written. If you look in some translations, it says one thing. If you look in other translations, it says another. So how many of you have King James and how many of you have New King James at your fingertips right now? What do you have? Or even if it's a different translation, which one do you have? It's contemporary language. Contemporary. Go ahead and read that one. What do you have over there? Uh, life application, but I can, I can use whatever. Life applications, which version? Mm, the study. No, which version? Okay. New King James. Do you have New King James? Can you look that up? And it's Luke 10. And can somebody give me, if you got a phone, I may have my phone. Okay, all your stuff is in there. I got this. I'm going to read um, King James. I like to read it from. So it's Luke 10, 17 through 20. So I'm going to read the King James first. And then I want to hear your translations. And make sure you speak loud. So the people online can also hear you. There's a couple of them on there. Hey, and if you guys have questions, if you want to make a comment, go ahead and do it. <laughs> okay, so Luke 10, 17 through 20, it says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And they're coming to Jesus saying that. And Jesus says to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you. I'm looking at the wrong translation. I'm looking at hers. Hold up. It's not right. I didn't check my translation, sorry. King James. 
Okay, so I and Jesus said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. So basically don't rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So if someone can read verse 19, if you can read verse 19. Okay, <clears throat> so the contemporary language that I have is intertwined between 18 and 20. Okay, cool. So do you just want yeah. me to read 18 through 20? That's good. <clears throat> Jesus said, I know I saw Satan fall, a bolt of lightning out of the sky, See what I've given you. Safe passes as you walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault of the enemy. No one can put a hand on you. All the same, the great triumph is not in your authority over evil, but in God's authority over you and presence with you. Not what you do for God, but what Ooh. God does for you. Amen. That's the agenda for rejoicing. All right. So hers is basically saying God is going to give you protect uh, his protective. What was the word? Protective? Authority. He said God is going to give you authority over you and presence with you. Okay. And so what does yours say? On verse protection 19. Protection from every assault. Protection of the enemy. from assault. That's of what it enemy. said. And what does yours say? I'll give you authority to trample over surface. Mm -hmm. and nothing should by any means hurt you yeah cool so there's a word power here in the beginning of verse 19 um when you look at king james her says authority which is the accurate translation of that word then it jumps down and says over all the power of the enemy power is accurately translated those are actually two different words and for some of you, some of you, were y'all here at the end of January? You were here at the end of January. Okay. So I'm going to just hit it real quick and, and give more application than what we did last time. So here's the thing. Authority and power are both needed in a Christian's life, but authority trumps power. So many people, some of you already know this, some people don't. They'll, the enemy has no authority. He was stripped of all authority when Jesus died and was resurrected. So the enemy has absolutely no authority only the authority that we give him. So if we've given him grounds in our life, either through our bloodline, somebody's given him authority, or if we've given him authority through our belief system saying, I'm, I'm believing that this kind of stuff is always going to happen to me. You're just basically handing over your life saying, you can do this to me. I'm giving you the authority to do it. You have so much authority. Man, I wish, uh, that's okay. That's okay. I want to tell somebody's vision, but instead I'm going to tell my own dream that I, or somebody else's dream that told me on the way here, but I'm, I'm going to bring it down. So here's the thing. <laughs> I, ha I have one too that I can use. So your authority actually trumps power, but you need, Christians need both, but the enemy only has one. The enemy does have power. People say the devil ain't got no power. Yeah, he does. You walk by somebody with the lust spirit, it's a lust power that you feel. You walk by somebody and you all of a sudden, um, you just feel a sense of bondage on them, or whenever you get around them, you feel depressed. Well, there's a depressed type of a spirit of oppression or something that's on their life, and you're feeling the power of that spirit operating in this person's life. The authority gave them access. The power is the operation of it. Okay? So that's a good way to summar summarize it. So let me tell you what power in this, in this instance is dunamis, and many of us have heard dunamis. And it basically means ability or capable of doing something, making something possible. So basically, it's an inward capacity to do something. It gives you the capacity to do something. So you have power means capacity, but it also means force. This is what you have the capacity for. Force, strength. I'm going to give you all these notes, but writing notes does help because it helps you remember things, okay? Mm -hmm. So write down the things that jump out to you. So power means force, strength violence and mighty wonderful work as christians we should have force the apostolic brings that violence out of a christian because the apostolic should be imparted to all of us but the the apostle gains territory apostles gain territory and apostles they conquer territory for the kingdom and the people of god that are under apostolic leadership 
are going to be a violent people that are going to say, not in my city, not in my house. I'm not going to just sit back and allow you to do whatever you're doing. I'm not going to fight the people. I'm not going to fight people to do it. But as the Lord leads me, I'm going to, I'm going to be fighting in the spirit room. And I'll show you, I'll tell you more about that as the Lord, um, as the Lord leads. And, and I'll even talk to you about the most powerful form of authority that a Christian can walk in. There's different levels of authority, but the most powerful one, uh, I'll tell you about that. So power also means ability, moral power, being able to govern yourself. You need power to be able to govern yourself. And excellence of soul, which is different than your spirit. If anybody tells you the soul and spirit are different, come see me. We'll talk. It's not the same. Completely different. As a matter of fact, they fight each other. The Word of God even tells us that. <laughs> our spirit and our soul are in conflict a lot of times when we're not walking in deliverance. Yes, honey, I'll, I'm going to actually send it to everybody, Shamika. Thank you, babe. She wants to know. <laughs> she always wants to know. I'm going to send it through our, through our messenger group like I did last time. So, how, and if you are not on our, our Facebook messenger group, text me. You can text me right now. It's not going to disturb me or anything. And I'll know, uh, either message me in Messenger or text me so uh, your email address so I can email it to you. Okay, so power and influence, power, oh, here's another one. Power and influence of one who has wealth. There's power and influence in wealth. So the people of God should not walk in poverty. Even if you have no money, you do not have to walk in poverty. You have the power to get wealth, didn't it say the power to get wealth? Yeah. Wealth is power because it gives you the wealth, it gives you influence. And in these world systems, it allows us to have influence in different places, not to buy our way in through moral -ish, morally depraved ways, but it allows us to have a voice in the world systems as well to go in and to break some of that stuff down. So God gives that. So sewing, sewing also helps with that. Um, or even just however God wants you to do that. You can sow in different ways. You can sow into ministries. You can sow into businesses. Um, you can build businesses. You know, all those different things allow you to have those, that, that type of influence. That's a power. There's a power influence when it comes to wealth. There's also a power uh, and influence arising from numbers. People, numbers of people. So what does that tell you? There's power in what? There's power in numbers. But what does that look like in the body? Power of numbers, power in numbers. There's power in, I know y'all are like, we can read your mind, could you just tell us? <laughs> Unity. <laughs> so we can't read your mind, April. I don't know. <laughs> so you just tell us. <laughs> right. There's power in unity. There's power and influence in unity. What happens if you see a hundred angry people walking down the street? There's power and influence in that. Yeah. What's going to happen? People around them, I'm not saying we as Christians should be walking angrily in the streets, right. but I'm just saying that gives you a good example. If you see people, even if it's a small group of people and they have weapons or there's some sort of anger, you know that there's a power on them where they might have ill intentions. Mm -hmm. You adjust yourself, protect yourself. You have to move because there is an influence that they're having on you in that moment. Mm -hmm. Not saying you should be afraid, but you may need to be careful. <laughs> you know, there's there is a power that their their power is giving a certain type of influence in what they're doing. So as Christians, we too can have that type of influence, that type of power that we walk in, and there are different ways that it looks for us. So what are some of the ways the power is expressed through us? Oh, it also says power in in or resting upon armies, forces, and hosts. And all of this is exhorted through either you or a group of people, power. So this gives you the, when you look at power with a Christian, it gives you the image of a warrior. This is the warrior side of us that operates through power. But I'm going to tell you the part of us that operates through authority, and that's the highest authority. So, but being a warrior is the highest form of power as a Christian. So how does this look? How is power released through us? Now, we already know that I've deliberately stayed away from church experiences, but we can talk about that now. Some of the, because normally when we think power, we think of it all inside of the church. But I gave you an understanding. This is, this is not Webster. 
This is, this is Greek meanings for power, for dunamis, not Webster. A lot of times people look in the Bible and go to Webster. The only time I'll go to Webster is if the Bible, if the Greek or the Hebrew said the exact same word. Then I'll go to Webster to look for deeper definitions of what it looks like in English. Just let me all know that whenever you do this study. Because sometimes if you looked, because if you looked at this scripture in the King James Version, Luke 10, and you saw, behold, I've given you power, you would have gotten the wrong idea of what it was. But now that you know it's dunamis, that type of, it, sorry, that, that wasn't dunamis, that particular first one was authority, which is exousia, and we'll talk about that. So that lets you know there is a difference. So you first look in your, your Greek, and then you go to the, the, the Webster is still fine, but it's a secondary uh, source. So here's some things that power is released through words, right? It's released through words. One of the ways it's released through words is just through exhorting. Faith actually, yeah. faith actually combined with words will go in and impart into people and cause explosions. This is, this is what an exhorter does. An exhorter will get you to believe anything that they believe when they're out there preaching to you. If you were tired and you were depressed, you get an exhorter in front of you talking, before you know it, you didn't change your mind. Why? Because everything that, they, that their words pack power, and it's faith is the type of power that, that it packs. And it imparts into you, and all of a sudden, you start believing different. You're like, yeah, I can. Yeah, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> what, is the, what is the word people get rah-rah? <laughs> I'm not a millennial, but I try to use millennial words. Okay, Charmink, I'm going to sit down with you and tell you how to get some of this stuff, okay? All right, she's looking for some uh, references. Another one is through acts, things that you do. So movement exerts a power. And what happens is power blows, and spiritually speaking, power will impart into us, shift things, but it also can release in the atmosphere and cause things to shift in the atmosphere. Power can do that. Power with authority, boy, is something else, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So through acts, you can do different things of power. Um, like I can go beat somebody up. That's an exertion of physical power. <laughs> or I can um, lay hands on someone. It's an actual physical touch. I can dance under the power of the anointing that's in me and start releasing things into the atmosphere, fear through prophetic dance. There's different ways of acts, things that you do can release power through your hands. I talked about that through movement, through sound. You don't even have to have words, but led by the Holy Spirit, there are times when we may sing and it's just sounds that's coming out of us and it starts shifting the atmosphere. All of a sudden you start cracking and breaking and crying and you're feeling the presence of the Lord because there is a power that's being released, that's shifting things in the atmosphere by power. And some people actually try to deliver people by way of power. You can Power and authority is needed with deliverance, not just power, because you will get tired. You'll start striving, operating under, you know, the err of God. <laughs> God wants to show you there's a higher way to shift things. So what is authority? Authority is exousia, which is, behold, I've given you authority. What does that say again? Behold, I've given you. I'm going to look it up. Here on my little phone. Can you spell that word? Exousia, yes. Uh, e X O U S I A. And that's a Greek word as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to the New King James. And Luke 10 and 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and, and scorpions. Basically, so, uh, serpents and scorpions are different types of demonic um, entities, attacks, entities, basically, demonic entities. There are some that attack. There are some that squeeze. There's some that bite. You know, there's different types of manifestations and not getting too deep into that, but Basically, any type of a way that the enemy may try to, um, may try to, okay, I was just looking at their comments. Any type of way that we can be uh, attacked, that is a power that we have authority over, okay? So verse 19 talks about our authority over power. So authority trumps power. Um, this is what it means. It means 
it is lawful. It actually comes from a word called exesti. I'm probably saying it wrong because I'm from Texas. <laughs> Ex exousia comes from a word of exesti, which means it is lawful, not legalism, but meaning it is lawful, meaning I have a right. So when you have a spiritual or even a natural right to something, this is the problem. When someone has a natural right to something, but they're not allowed to move in that natural right, it brings oppression. It brings oppression. But God is saying, I have given you authority, and definitely in the spirit, even when you don't have natural authority to move, I've given you spiritual authority that no one can take from you, that nobody can quench unless you let them. That doesn't mean that you're exercising your authority over people. In the only, you, we don't exercise spiritual authority over people in a way that is self-serving. We talked about this last year, last week, that is self-serving or that is manipulative or that is controlling. We never exercise spiritual or natural authority over people in that way. You only have spiritual authority over people if they allow you to. Your boss has not said that it's okay for you to have spiritual authority over them, but you do have spiritual authority over you and the atmosphere, wherever the feet, soles of your feet try to pump belong to you. So you can shift things by prayer. You can shift. There's ways that God does it without you controlling people is what I'm saying. And unfortunately, sometimes people come and they start controlling you and try to get you to think the way they want you to think and this and that. Instead of letting God be God and you exercising your authority over the atmosphere because that belongs to me whether you like it or not. And I can pray these things. I may not come to you, um, come to my boss who I'm having issues with. I may not come to him saying, and sometimes I've heard Christians say things um, along these lines, but they'll come like, I have authority here in the name of Jesus, and you can't do this and you can't do that. You're out of order. That person does have natural authority over you. You don't go in there, and, and why would they even want God now? You done made them seem like God don't like them, and you over them, and you're this and that, and you want that. They fired me because they didn't like me. No. They fired you because you were not humble. <laughs> you weren't humble, and you were not being led by the Lord the way you're supposed to be led by the Lord in the atmosphere where many people don't know what to do. They don't know this. So I want to keep moving on. So authority gives you the legal right to something. It means delegated influence. So when you've been given by God authority to influence things, this is when you've been given authority by God to influence things outside of you. Authority also means jurisdiction. It means liberty, freedom. Where you're not free in the natural, you are free in the spirit. <laughs> Nobody can take that from you. Um, it also means power, but in a different way. It means right strength. Authority authorizes spiritual access, so you don't have to beg for anything that you already have authority to do, or to be, or to have. I don't have to beg God for finances. I don't have to beg him for stuff. He's already said yes. So one way of exercising our authority is through declaration. So even though faith comes through words, declaration, I'm sorry, authority also comes through words. So I'll give a quick testimony. I think I've given it on Facebook before. In 2008, I started declaring things that I was waiting on God for, and I found out that God was waiting on me. I, was, I did not know. I was wasting time. God was actually waiting on me. He was like, you have power and you have authority in your words. So I started declaring certain things every day, and I started seeing everything start to shift. I mean, stuff was shifting quickly. The whole earth had to respond. My world had to respond to the words coming out of my mouth. It had to because I spoke them. God gave me authority over my life and over the atmosphere around me. When I prayed, I'm like, well, I've been praying, I've been fasting. And he's like, yeah, and I already said yes. In the spirit, if you want it in the, in the earth room, you open the door for that. We have authority to open things up in the natural realm so that which is in the spirit can come to us by faith. It's so cool how it works. I'll get more into it when we talk about gifts because I'll, I'll get off track right now if I try to get into it. But, and that'll be next <coughs> month. Any questions? So your authority is your birthright as a Christian to have dominion. It's your birthright. It's your birthright something that you were born again to have. Just like when they were born, 
they bore the last name of their parents. One of my kids has ha half my name. <laughs> this one got my name, but they have, she has the name of her father. The other one has the name of her, of her father. But my oldest daughter's 22 now. She has the name of her father. It was her right to bear his name. It's my right to bear my dad's name. Well, now my husband has claimed me. Kinsman would do. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a right to bear his name. I have a right to um, his bank account. I have a right to a lot of stuff. <laughs> just, you know, just things. Whatever's his is mine. <laughs> I have a right to it. You know, I was I was given that authority as his wife. So here's the thing. We our part of our authority and dominion is to bring heaven to earth. All this still goes along with revival. Y'all keep walking with me in movements, which we just talked about. So how do we increase our power and authority? Oh, sorry. The, me the most important thing. The highest level of authority is being a bride. Every Christian has some authority. Authority is not just given to us by God carte blanche, meaning just an open written check where we just have all authority to just do whatever we want to do, however we want to do it. God wants us to be responsible with authority. So even for me and my husband launching this ministry, he placed it inside of me in 2001. I had to wait all these years. Technically, we started last week, just 17 years, you know, before we could launch it. Why? He gave it to me then, but he didn't give me the authority to operate in it until later. Why? Because he wanted me to ramp up in maturity to handle it. In the meantime, he taught me a lot of stuff along the way. And my authority increased more and more and more. My realm of influence increased more and more and more. So even though I had authority, I didn't have the authority then that I have now. Um, and I don't have the authority now that I will have. Because some people say, hey, but you got this word in your mouth. You got this and that. Yeah, but until God feels like I'm, I'm ready, it may not may just be a responsibility. It may just be a matter of raising people up. That's part of it. You know, he's not going to give us more than what we can manage. That's part of it. The other part is he's going to help us to increase in our understanding of how this thing operates. And we have to be faithful over the people that are here before he's going to give us more. And we have to be good stewards over that if we're expecting more from God. So this, those are the things. We increase in authority. And a bride, a bridal relationship is different. I remember when he called me into a bridal relationship with him. And I was like, oh, we're not all the bride? He said, no, not everybody has accepted that bridal place. And so I said, well, I don't feel like I'm the bride yet. He says, well, when you first got married, you were no less a wife then than you were five years into the marriage. You grow even as a bride. I was like, oh, thank you. That helps. It's a commitment. And then he says, but I'm committed to you too. So that was great. So it was a different relationship. And he said, there's some things that have to fall off your life. There are relationships that fell off. Some of them I knew. They were falling off. Some of them, I didn't know why they fell. I'm sitting here looking like, what is going on? Because there were people's voices in my mind, in my ear, that were competing with what God was telling me to do. And we're not rogue. We're not rogue Christians, you know? They're like, don't tell me. God tells me. It wasn't like that. <laughs> it was definitely God, you know, saying. So anyway, not going into that. That's a whole other story. And not all of it was bad. It was just he had to adjust us in different ways. No big deal. But I had to make sure, he wanted to make sure that his was the primary voice that I heard. And so as a leader, our job is to point you to Christ to where you can be a bride. He told me two things. He said, I want you to find the generals, the warriors, and I want you to find the bride, and I want you to merge the two. The people that are called to this ministry are not just supposed to be warriors. They're not just supposed to be brides. They're supposed to be both. These are going to be the strong leaders that you saw. Because they have the she she gave me a prophetic word. I'm just sitting here like this woman. She's very prophetic. And she gave me a word and, and it was it was the same thing, but she gave me more color to it. But it was the same thing that God spoke to us and to other people too. And I was like, Oh wow, this is amazing. Is it really help? Sometimes when you get that that word is refreshing and it reminds you because you worry. I don't want this to turn into what people, you know, have, what hurt people and this and that. And God keeps saying, the very fact that you really, really don't want that. <laughs> I keep hearing that too. The fact that you really don't want that, chances are, you know, they're going to be all right. But anyway, here's the thing. So being a bride 
is a commitment to the Lord to where I am committed to yield to you, God. I'm committed to yield to you in everything. It doesn't mean that you have to ask God, should I eat Fruit Loops or Cheerios? If you want to ask him that, fine. And if you don't get it, he says, God doesn't tell me what to eat. Maybe I shouldn't eat. Some people get real legalistic and they just kind of take it out of proportion. No, it just means that I'm being led. I'm, I'm in a relationship with him. So I'm just talking to him about everything. He's guiding me. When I'm stuck, I let him unstick me from stuff. I start asking him questions. Think of, think of God differently. Because a lot of times we look at this. If you've been through the exchange, you probably have been, um, you're aware of some of this. But think of it this way. If you're in a stuck place with, let's say, your best friend, you're going to sit down and talk to them and say, what happened? Or what's going on with you, right? And, well, what is it about me that you're kind of saying this kind of, you know, making you stand off? You're going to talk to your friend like that, right? But we don't talk to God like that. Instead, we're hurting. And we're saying, God, just fix it. But God is saying, I want you to dialogue with me different. This is why you're not getting answers. Ask me, and I say this all the time, God, will this situation is going on and I don't see you really moving in it. I'm not going to feel rejected like you don't want me. I'm going to ask you, what is it that you're after in me that needs to be changed? Because God is more interested in drawing you closer to him and for you to develop that stronger character. Not just character and, and for the sake of character. He wants you to develop his nature. He wants to make an imprint and a deposit on you to where the two of you are one. So he's like, talk to me. Oh, well, God, what is it that you're after in me that maybe I'm holding on to, but you just want me to be more like you so we can be closer. That's all he wants. He is a lover. He's an intense lover, but not in some nasty, filthy way, the way the world would think of a lover. It's the most beautiful, pure place of him wanting to come into every part of you and every icky, icky, yucky stuff that's going on in your brain. And he's like, I'm not even judging you like I love you. I already knew that stuff was in you, but I still want to be in with you. Like, I just can't wait for you to talk to me. I just can't wait for us to just sit and just spend time again. Like he's a lover and he's so concerned about everything. And people will tell us, God, they worry about your problems. They don't have a, re a good relationship with the Lord. They don't know him like that. I'm not saying they don't know him at all. They just don't know him like that. And they'll sit there and tell you, God, they worry about you crying. There's biblical evidence that he does care. He goes to Mary and Martha. They're over there crying. Mar now, Mary is like, if you wouldn't have, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus is crying with her, knowing full well that he was going to raise him up. Before he even died, he knew he was going to raise him up. But he's still crying with her because he does care how she feels. And he says, what did he say? She starts, she starts crying and stuff. The next thing he says, where they lay him? Where'd they lay him? <laughs> My baby over here crying. It's, it's time to fix this. Where'd they lay Because <laughs> he cared about how she felt. And he said, Jesus even wept. The shortest scripture in the Bible. Jesus wept. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> he does care. He'll say, God, don't be kidding me. Now we start whining and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes he has to say, okay, baby, get a grip. But I don't mean that he don't care about you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Just like, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it increase? It increases in yielding to him in every way. So here's something we're going to do. We're going to declare something. We're going to declare something because one of the things that is the most difficult for people to do as a Christian is to walk in power and authority. It's difficult because they don't know what it looks like health, in a healthy way. They've seen it abused. They've seen people abuse their power, abuse their authority, and they don't want to be that way. That was one of the biggest struggles I know I personally had is I said, well, God, you know, I want to step up. I want to do this and that, but I would kind of pull myself back a lot. And it's so funny because a lot of ministers will pull you back on purpose because they don't want you to become a Jezebel. There are fewer Jezebels than there are people that are afraid to walk. I'll be honest with you. Most people are afraid to get up and walk. And even Jezebel needs love too. And you just have to deal with them. You just have to deal with Jezebel and just say, this is what you ain't going to do. <laughs> this is what you're not going to do. And when you put that boundary there, they'll either be delivered and they'll change because they need that deliverance. They're one of the hardest personality, uh, hardest deliverance needs to be the hardest people that need to be delivered that have that type of spirit, the manipulation and control, it's one of the hardest to, to deliver, but it's not impossible because 
God, <laughs> because God, <laughs> he could deliver anybody. But we become afraid of them. Why? Because they have a predatory, aggressive spirit. But if you have a strong ministry full of love, integrity, and boundaries, and strong people, you don't have to worry about them rising up. They only going to, I'm not saying people are devils, but the enemy working in somebody, I'll put it this way. The devil don't do nothing you don't let them do. So if you say no, and they, oh, they're going to just try to rip up your church. Well, guess what? Intercessors, we're going to pray love over this person, but we're going to start doing some prayer walks around this building, or we're going to start interceding and saying what will and won't happen. God don't allow the people that don't understand to be sifted. You know, there's ways of doing these things in love, but still doing it aggressively to where the enemy just can't just run all over you. People really feel that way because they like get scared. But it's time for us to raise up in power and authority and not be afraid. So we're going to do something. I declare. We're going to say, I declare. I declare. I'm releasing fear. I'm releasing fear. And I'm receiving courage. And I'm receiving courage. To walk in power and authority. To walk in power and authority. Now say it for real. <laughs> now that you know. Releasing fear. I'm and I'm receiving courage. And I'm receiving courage to walk in power and authority. To walk in power and authority. And that's it. Take your journey. You just declared it. Take your journey with him. Take your journey. Release that and receive your courage and walk in power and authority. And I know just like authority is gained, power is gained incrementally, but keep walking, keep moving. Don't shrink back. You may pause for a minute and say, God, what is this? with the intention, like how I'm standing now, with the intention of, I want to move forward, but I'm going to pause because I want to hear from you and make sure I'm going in the right direction. Oh, okay, I need to pivot this way. Okay, we're going to go. And just keep walking. And I know we have to be careful. I'm not saying just go and just rip up, you know, stuff and overturn tables. Thank you, Shami, because she put that on your voice. So how does warfare look when you're walking in power and authority? The bride and the warrior both need to merge together. And I talked to you guys actually a little bit about that just now. Um, but the bride operates in a higher level of authority, so she doesn't do anything. She, meaning she or he, the bride of Christ, does not do things in their own strength, their own way. You always, biblically, they always inquired of the, the good kings. Before they went to war, they would inquire of the Lord, should we go up and fight them? <laughs> There have been times when I was like this, I saw a situation in the spirit, not people. I'm a, intensely a lover when it comes to people. But when it comes to the demons, I'll be like, Oop, you know, because he trained me up in warfare in a very aggressive and scary way. One day we'll talk about it. <laughs> Actually, probably at the end of the month, we may talk about some of those things. So people can open up and start talking about their experiences and things they dealt with so they can get questions answered. So we may not do the prayer impact. We may just do it. Because I was asking the Lord, I felt like he was saying the last day of the month, the last Sunday of the month is going to be different, but I wasn't sure what the, what different mess. So that's my baby crying, so you know I'm kind of, is it just her feelings this time? I don't know, that's what I'm saying. I don't because okay. so. I don't see anything that is transpired. Okay, not worried about it. You know I'm the mama in the room. Like, ah, I hear that. Ah, ah. I said, that's my baby. <laughs> Did you see why she cried? I'm like, <laughs> I couldn't even stop. I don't even know what I was saying. I was That's like, time crying. it is. I didn't hear this one. She probably lost the card game. Not to worry about the baby. She'll be okay. So anyway, she got it. She got somebody back there who got it. You know, that's I just said. I'd be like, flexing. You know? <laughs> kind of my baby. I'm like, she all right. I ain't thinking about nobody. Just, is she okay? So anyway, <laughs> who's laughing at me? So <laughs> anyway. But yeah, I'll see a situation rise in the spirit, and I'm like this, but I'll stop. Because sometimes God was telling, there are times in warfare when I was coming with swords, and he was like, I want you to worship. And I even had a dream about this. And the Lord, the Lord kept saying in my ear, I saw little devils just coming, and just a bunch of them just coming. I had a sword, and I was like, okay, I'll worship with one hand and fighting the other. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. I'm like, but this is how I'm going to get them up. No, you're trying to use your power. I want you to learn how to use authority. So there are times when you're worshiping and you're pouring out your heart 
on what you desire to see happening in this earth or in your situation. And he looks at you, not like he looked at Martha, where he was trying to convince her to understand what the resurrection was. He looks at you and says, where have you, where'd they lay him? Where'd they, where'd they put him? She's crying out to me. She's worshiping. She's pouring out. This is what it looks like. And I had a dream. It was last year. This is when we were going into this intense bridal thing. And it was me. Uh, instead of giving the whole dream, it was me and Jesus. And we were standing in front of each other. And we only spoke a few words. Not a lot, not a lot of words. But there was something that was going into me and out into him. It was like a sharing of hearts. It was like a pouring in and out, the two of us. And so I started learning how to stand, to just lay before him and just breathe him in. There are times when I just feel, that happened even last night during worship. I was just, he said, okay, I want you to lay face down on the floor. So I laid face down on the floor and I'm just breathing. Then he says, okay, now I want you to kneel. And I'm thinking, my knees. He said, you'll be all right. Get on my knees. And I was, I was fine. I'm, I lean over and I'm just breathing in. Then he says, I want you to curl up on your side. I don't know why. I like to know why, but he's not telling me why. I'm just doing what he says. So I'm laying on my side and it's just, it gets more intense, you know, and he's just saying, okay. And he's just having me breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And then it was like a revival last night. So then when, you know, hands were being laid and all that, they didn't even have to be by me i was feeling the lord wherever i was and i was just, i was just like it's like my capacity was just breathing in i'm just receiving all this stuff right and sometimes it's just a heart exchange and it bypasses our understanding when we're in the presence of god you're like well god i don't know how to do that i'm gonna tell you one one major thing that you can do that will always get you into the presence of the lord if you turn on worship music you don't even have to you don't even have to sing to start praying in tongues, pray with fervor, because what happens is when you're wanting to get into the spirit realm, you need something that's going to open the gate to the spirit realm. Tongues will get you there every time. If you pray every day in the spirit, you're going to be a bad somebody because <laughs> you're communicating with God, but it also just opens up the spirit realm. So that's a trick I can tell you. And when we talk about getting into the glory realm of prayer, that's one way of just literally opening up the realm of glory, heaven. And when that happens, you don't need people to touch you and lay hands. Heaven is coming to you. And this is what we're leading up to. God wants us to be carriers of his glory. So here's, uh, we, we talked about, oh, let me tell you what this is. So let's go on a journey. We're going to go on a journey. And I want, I want Colin to be able to turn. I just want to see Okay. So let's go on a journey. We're just going to listen to the Lord really briefly. Can't go wrong with Nathaniel Cole. When all else fails, turn on Nathaniel Cole. Sorry if this is loud, guys. So we're just going to, can you guys hear me? Give me a thumbs up or just say yes if you can still hear me over the music. Yes. So God, we're just coming before you right now. We're going on a journey. I shut down every competing voice. Lord God, we only want to hear you. I shut down every competing vision. In the name of Jesus, our own mind will not even be able to get in the way of you right now, God. Open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts, our, our, our spiritual senses of Jesus in you so that we can receive messages from you. I believe, God, that you're going to show us something. So in the name of Jesus, Lord God, open us up to the seeing realm, the hearing realm, the feeling realm, the touch realm, the smell, the taste, whatever it is, God, that you're wanting to reveal to us. Open up our discernment and our ability, Lord God, to receive from you right now. And I ask you, Jesus, that you will speak to us and show us what does my life look like when I'm operating in greater authority and greater power? God, show us right now, what does my life look like when I'm operating in greater authority and greater power?
Superwoman. Eva, did you hear that? <laughs> She's online. Go ahead. Superwoman. It, was, it was Superwoman. Um, but the crown, um, it was a crown full of jewels. Mm. Um, and I seen a sword. <laughs> uh, killer. I gave her a word the other day. I was like, God says she's a killer. <laughs> and that's how I was like, huh. Maybe she need to repeat the question. No, <laughs> no. You saw, right? <laughs> you saw right. You saw right. Anybody else? You could have even gotten an impression, just felt something about it, about yourself. Did you guys get anything? I just saw like a smile. You saw a small light? Okay. You saw a light. And like I saw like a a line? No. That's all that I see. I just saw like, like I didn't see myself, but I just saw like I, I, I envisioned like I was like floating on the ground uh, towards like uh, just like a line or it's a rope. A rope. And then I saw like a light. Like, and, uh, that's big. So around the the light, what did you see? Was it dark? Um, yeah. Or was it white and fuzzy or? Well, it was all like under my lid. So okay. everything was pretty much dark black and like okay. little red. And I, I could see like just a little of the light, but around it, yeah, it was dark. But you saw like a rope, you were pulling the rope. Yeah, I saw the rope. It was like two different mm -hmm. scenarios. Mm -hmm. I saw the light and then I saw the rope. And I was like going this way and then I saw the light. Wait. You're going one direction yeah, and the so, light was somewhere else. Yeah. So I was like holding grabbing onto the road, like this way, and then I saw the light like straight across from me. So that word we had earlier, God is saying let go of some things mm -hmm. so that you can that was actually very powerful and that was definitely from the Lord. Let go of some things that has you going in a different direction than what God wants you to go in. He's showing you the light and he wants you to let go of it. So you can go straight. This has you very long. That was very impactful. What about you? Did you feel something? What about you? I didn't get a vision, but I heard God tell me that I can have anything I want. Mm -hmm. As long as I am ready to continue to acknowledge him. Wow. And then, yeah. And he told me, um, I heard him say, I'll give it to you guys as well. Mm -hmm. I'll give it, but first you have to acknowledge me. Yeah. And it just kind of kept playing over. So basically, he's saying um, self strength 
many times we'll hold on to self-strength because we're like, I'm going to do it. I got to hold it together. I got to make it happen. I have to do this. I have to do that. And your letting go is acknowledging him and allowing you to be led by him. Because what happens with the bride, the bride has to get her marching orders from God. Otherwise, she's exposed. And so many times we're doing a lot of stuff in our own strength. We're fighting for our families. We're fighting for our kids. We're fighting for a lot of stuff. And God is like, would you hold up? Let me tell you first if you should even fight this battle. And number two, how to fight it. Because maybe I want you to worship. Maybe I want you to say something. Or maybe I don't want you to say anything at all. And you're saying too much. Just let him guide you through the battle so you can be efficient. And so that God, you can move out of his way and let God be God. But when you acknowledge him every step, that means he's saying, I want you to check in with me. I want you to trust me in all of your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. What you see? Wait, I'm going to get to two minutes. What did you see? Um, I was just going to say also that I heard, I heard the other day um, where God said, I can give you everything you kind of think you can confirm. Yeah. Um, I just saw the quick, quick glimpse of like a lion. Um, the lion's not bothered. And, um, a lion, you said a lion's not bothered? They yeah. They want stuff from a real chill place. Right, they do. They run <laughs> stuff from a chill place. If you're online, go ahead and you can say whatever you saw too. <laughs> if you saw anything, let us know. Go ahead. Um, I saw orange. Um, I was like, the Lord, why are you showing me orange? Yeah, let me look at it. <laughs> go ahead. You saw um, orange? Mm -hmm. But then it started resonating. When it started, I said, hey, my lips are burning. Right? And as you were teaching, the, the burn was spreading throughout. Yeah. <laughs> Burning ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what he was saying mm. was I'm increasing the fire. Yeah. And if you let me increase your fire, uh my authority was attached to that. And you've been trying to figure out how um my glory is gonna show up, you know, and it has mm -hmm. to do with your authority and I have been quiet. You know, um so he probably showed you um, that that orange was fire, but I just heard something else. Orange means perseverance. It also means perseverance. But here's something else. In the flesh, it also means stubbornness or perseverance or stubbornness, depending on how you operate. But I heard something else. It started with your mouth, fire in your mouth. So there is God. Come here. I want them to see you. This is Miss Virginia. She's my mama. We look just alike. <laughs> yes, we do. We're twins. Hi, hey, Miss Virginia. Y'all sound like it's a good class. <laughs> I've been working in the other room. Y'all have a good time. I was whispering to them about you. Oh, you were. I said last time she came in the late hands. I was oh, like, yeah. <laughs> we well, have fun. That's always fun. This, this looks like that you're you're moving forward and uh -huh. some dynamics there. So I'm not interrupting nothing. Yeah, so we love you. Fun. Yeah. Bye bye. You definitely want mamas in your corner. We need our mamas. <laughs> so, um, yeah, God says if you want to see things change, then you got to deploy it. I was like, oh, it's a lot. And remember that time I said it starts from the, it's been started from the top of the day. So today's lesson was about part one about marriage. <laughs> the, second, right? the second part was about what God's love really looks like and what his, his glory, his, his example looks like and how it has to do with what you say. Mm -hmm. That's all I was in your life. Okay. Yeah. So That's good. Like that. Our declarations are very important. Ah, <laughs> Lenita's like, Miss Virginia, she's giving hearts. We love Miss Virginia. So. We went on our journey. Now I'm gonna. Now we've built all this up. Basically, the way God, the way God had me prepare this, was He said, He just had a series of questions. What is authority? What is power? What is this? What is that? I mean, just like that. Those were my points. Were questions. So we talked about um, what is power? What is authority? How do they increase? What does warfare look like? You know, given all these things. 
Then the other question is, what is revival? And then what is reformation? What is a glory carrier? Why have alignments and tribes? Um, so he had all of these questions. And what is the purpose of the anointing on your life? All these different things. So we're going to go through this. He always gives me a lot of stuff. And we're, we are heavy on teaching. So a lot of times with the teaching, you're plowing ground. But here's, here's what is revival. Revival comes to improve you, okay? It's the, and, and to improve the operation of things on the earth. So in the very beginning, we talked about how revival comes in different movements and different expressions and the way the Lord expresses himself. So if you guys are just jumping on kind of in the middle, when we're done, go back to the very beginning so you can get more understanding on the revival, on what revival and what movements do. Um, some of it was a little bit new revelation and some of the things that we read as well. Um, we read from this, Lanita, <laughs> page 71 through 78, just so you know. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, so revival comes to improve you. It comes to improve the operation of things on the earth. It comes to shift and bring change. It ushers in moves of God. And each move of God brings in a new wineskin, which is what we were talking about earlier, new wineskins, new ways of beholding God, new ways of understanding the Lord. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> so the revival comes to give us new expressions of God and giving us deeper understanding of who he is. So one revival may have come to give us one revelation of God. But as God continues to reveal himself, just like the seraphim that we were talking about earlier, they were they were giving us more deeper expressions of who God is. Uh -oh. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to get her? Do you want me to bring her? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. You want to hang out with me? You want to hang out with me? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you want, I can have the little one. If, well, the little one's fine. She's chilling, wrapped up in a little way. Okay. So they're good. <laughs> she got me on the phone. She's not worried. She's like, I'm sitting on the phone. So <laughs> she's like, it's all chill. Okay, sorry, guys. Okay. So. <laughs> So Azusa Street, we talked about Azusa Street a little bit. Azusa Street was one revival. It was one humongous move of God, and it ushered in a lot of other moves of God. From Azusa Street, we got the healing movement, the Pentecostal movement. We have all these other movements that came out of it. But we can go back to 1500s. In the 1500s, Martin Luther, this is, sorry, I'm not going to go there. I'll keep going. So this move of God, the, the move of God that we're in right now, there are different moves that are within this move. It's usually the, the real big powerful moves that really just start shaking things and it changes things to where it's never the same. So when Martin Luther came, 1500s, that was a breaking away from the Catholic Church. It's never been the same. Yeah. And so here we have um, different other expressions and it came through denominations because that's what they were breaking away from was Catholicism. So now they're like, okay, let's Let's break away and let's have denominations that express the way that we understand God, the, the way that he's revealing to us. So the Baptists are really strong in their word, and they're, they're going to drill you on the Bible, but that's their thing. The Pentecostals, sometimes they were more interested in the experience. They were having all these experiences like the first Corinthian, like, like sorry, the Corinthian church, Church of Corinth. They had all these different experiences, and so maybe not as much word balancing them, right? So one is looking at the other like they're doing the wrong thing, but that, that's not true. They're just operating in different expressions. That's why we have these denominations. Then people come and we're like, we don't want denominations anymore. We just want the moves of God that's within it. We just want the expressions of God. So with the apostolic movement, it kind of converges all that. Then you have the word of faith movement, the name it and claim it movement. That's, that came later on. You have the healing movement where you had Amy, uh, uh, Amy, McPherson, Simpleton, I don't think she was in the healing movement, she was in one of the other ones, but then you had Captain Coleman, who was in the healing movement. All of these different movements, you had Smith Wigglesworth, who was a part of one of the movements, I can't remember which one it was, but he was sometime after, after, uh, after Azusa Street. So you have all these different movements that are happening, and now we're in another place 
So every time a reformation happens, every time there's an, a, every time revival happens, a reformation has to happen. God has to reform the way things are done. So reformation means the action or process of reforming an institution or practice. You've got to change the wine skin of that thing in order for the move or the revival to happen. So there's two things that are going on when you have a powerful move of God like this is, that's supposed to sweep the nation. We see, uh, we see negatives and we see positives. We're seeing a lot of people that, and, and again, I don't dishonor the church. I'm just giving you facts on what everybody pretty much sees. You see people moving away from church. They're tired of church. It's not the church is bad. A lot of these pastors have laid their life down. They didn't sacrifice everything for the, for the gospel, okay? So I'm not saying that. But with it has come the manipulation and control, not with every church, but with many of them. Many of them don't even realize they have it because it's just a part of the religious structure. It's a part of the wineskin, says. So in order to come out of it, you have to change the wineskin. You have to reform the way things are done. You have to change the way the institution looks. That's a mama. So I'm going to say with your baby. Are you going in and the other baby? <laughs> So all those things need to happen. So the institution needs to change or the wine skin needs to change. What's poured out, the wine itself needs to be different. It needs to be brand new. That's the revival. So the wine skin is the reformation that needs to be changed. And the revival is the wine being poured out. That needs to be changed. We talked about that, in, I think, the very first message we had. And many moves of God, they overlap, too. They come in waves. They come in waves. So, but... I want y'all to understand something. This apostolic movement is to build the kingdom in a way that has never really, is actually, anytime you're looking at Reformation, it's supposed to bring you back to the original state of something. It's supposed to bring you back to the original state. So based on people's revelation, it depends on what that original state looks like. So when they tried to break away from the Catholic Church, they were trying to break away to get back to the way things were supposed to be initially. But it ended up getting bound in religion because some of those practices stayed. Why did they stay? Because of the way people's structures of mind was. They were free from Catholicism. Now the Catholicism is still going, right? People are still praying to you know, people, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. praying to people. And as Raul broke that down for us, I think last week, he said it's all for him. He was like, it's not for him. He was like, it's witchcraft. You're praying to people to do something when you should be praying to God. If you lose something, you pray to this saint. If you, you yeah. um, need this, and basically you're praying to these entities. And, and y'all, going way back, just to let you know how this actually started, way back with Constantine and all them, how it actually started was literally they had, they were idol worshipers. They worshiped Greek gods and all these different things. And literally, when they made Christianity legal, they literally renamed the deities, and boom, there you have the Catholic Church. So yes, they were used to praying to these people, so they kept that system in place and threw Jesus in there because they were trying, they were trying their best just to bring Jesus in, not realizing that it wasn't the right system, but that was their way of trying to bring it in so that people would gravitate towards Christ. Eventually, those things have evolved over time. And so now here we are today where we're getting, there's an angst among people. Something needs to change. I love the people. I love church, but I'm not feeling this. And I'm not saying this for everybody. Some people love it, and that's great. I'm not, I'm not trying to sow discord. But I'm just saying, this is really a reality. People are dealing with this. I want something different. I don't understand it. Or I feel like I'll go there and nobody knows me. Or I'm doing this and that. And churches are doing their best to try to make sure that you know who they are know people and they touch and for some reason it's broken. Why? Because the wine skin doesn't work in a church like that. For every church. Some churches have done well because they understand if you want people to feel like they belong to something, you need to bring them into a smaller place. For some people, the ministries they're involved in gives them a sense of community. For some people, they actually need a community to go to, which is why we said everything we're doing, we're building, is inside of a community. We're building everything inside of a community so that people can talk to each other, look at each other, and, and fellowship it afterwards and eat a little something or whatever. And last week, I felt this strong sense of unity, like this family thing that just started happening, and it was like a vibe. But mo most of them have gone to the 
revival all this weekend and they tired. They didn't come today. <laughs> but they're they're actual members of Kingdom Enlightenment. We have ten members now. Ten actual members and other people that are just coming in. So there's more people than what you guys see today. And some of them joined online. <laughs> we had sick babies. We have you know things that were going on that people had to take care of. So that reformation is basically changing that. So if you guys want to understand the wine skin that we're in right now, and you're feeling that sense of angst, read this book. It is an easy read. It's called Revival Hubs Rising. And I encourage everybody coming through Kingdom Enlightenment to read this book. It gives you the language of the stuff that you'd be like, wait a minute. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, but it gives you the language and it packages it much better to understand. This is actually our second alignment. So we aligned with Ryan Lestrange's ministry, um, and it was just made official this past week. This is our secondary alignment. Um, Becky Castle is our first um, apostolic alignment. Okay, so what does it mean to be a glory carrier? Every single one of us houses the presence of God. Can you stand up? So, can you hold this right here to your belly? Right here. And you stand up. I'm just giving you all that. Oh, get your bottle. Okay. That's good. And hold that to your belly. And so, <laughs> so, so you're holding that to your belly. Think of it. If I had a box, I would say to hold a box in front of you, but I don't have a box. So water bottles will work. So you're holding this water bottle right here, right? This, think of it as a doorway. Think of the water bottle as being a doorway to the spirit realm. And so even though you have natural access of things that you can touch, feel, smell, and all that, you have a doorway on the inside of you because the Lord, it says in the word of God that he actually has been, the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee. It's a myth to believe that every believer is not, does not have the Holy Spirit. Every believer may not be filled, but every believer has the Holy Spirit because it says that he's been given to us as a guarantee, a down payment that we've been marked <laughs> as a Christian, paid with, bought with a price, the Holy Spirit is in you, even if he has not been allowed to fill your being. But he's there in everybody. And because he's there, and because the Holy Spirit is God, what can God do? Like, it's simple. I you, promise you. It's, know how deep it is. Like, it's not what, deep. What, what can God do? But what can't he do? Exactly. God can do absolutely anything. God is everything good. God is absolutely everything, and he lives inside of you, not a piece of him. He says in his word that he wants the fullness of God to be revealed through humanity. The fullness is something we, it's going to take us a long time to even understand. The fullness of God? That means if God wants you to move in healings and all that, and sometimes people are like, but what is my gift? What is my gift? And I want people to erase that from their mind and, and instead ask God, what do I have access to? It's different because it's in the spirit realm. It resides in the spirit realm. So what gates and what realms do I have access to? What, what have you given me the authority to have access to in the spirit realm? That's actually what a gift is that you can open up or that's something that you can actually manage, okay? That's your anointing that you can manage. But if you can think of those water bottles, no matter how big or small they are, bursting open, just if you took the top off of it, you don't have to, but if you took the top off of that and all of heaven pours through this water bottle, it helps you to understand that we are all gateways from the spirit realm, as you become a Christian, you become a gateway from the supernatural to the natural realm. So all of you as a glory carrier, okay, <laughs> all of you as a, all of us as a glory carrier, no matter how small or great you feel like the glory is that you carry, and you should know that yes, so here's the thing, but I don't feel worthy enough. I don't feel like, you know, I'm all of this and that. Well, he died for you. Obviously, you are all of that and you are worth it. But I do this and I do that. Okay, so give it to him. But it does not mean that you don't still have all of heaven accessible inside of you. All of it. All of it. Everything is everything. <laughs> everything is just everything. 
And so that is so hard sometimes to fathom. Even, even me, I so walk that out. What does this look like in a, in a daily practice? What does it look like when, you know, I see a bill and I'm like, <laughs> do I believe that, oh, this is going to be hard? Or do I believe that he has been so faithful to me? Why can't he? My husband and I um, opened a business a few years ago. The debt that we fell in was unreal. We could have kicked ourselves and condemned ourselves, and we did for a little bit. I did. He's probably going to say, I did. <laughs> he always be like, I didn't. I'm like, whatever. And he probably did because he's a lot healthier than I am. So like, <laughs> no, I'm just, I just think a lot and I'll process things a lot. She's so cute. She walks on her phone. She really needs some balance. She's like, I think it's just going in. Nope. Psych. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, so we fell into, you know, we end up with all this debt. We were trying to do something good. I wanted my husband to come off of his job because of all the hours and he's away. He's working right now and don't want to. He's He was online, if he's still there, he's been driving all day. And so, um, yeah, so yeah. I'm like, well, let's start this business and get things going so my husband can come off his job and we can focus on the ministry or whatever. We'll have a, a business going, we'll have that. Well, it just, it just fell flat. And so I was like really distraught for a while and I said, God, I don't understand this. We probably, obviously, we probably missed you. And he said, what makes you think that? Because mm -hmm. of the debt, dude. This is a lot. This is bad. Like, this is bad that, yeah, I think we missed it. He says, no, I just want you to get used to big numbers. That's good. And not be shaken, no matter which way the numbers go. And I'm like, okay, but can you help us pay it off? <laughs> One of the reasons we were in debt is because of an investment that we that we partnered with and the money was mishandled by the person by the partner and so when it was since the deal fell through they had taken the money to other investments thinking that it was going to return and it was going to be okay and it didn't work out that way but we we're one of the blessed ones that they're actually paying on the debt but it's a lot if I told y'all y'all be like it's a lot <laughs> and then we had the personal debt from the other part. So I was like, God, you know, and we've had such a peace. I went through all of, you know, 2018, good. This year, good. Not worried. Why? Because all of our bills are still paid. We're still able to manage what we need to manage. And we're not worried because the Lord has given us a word that we're going to be wealthy. We're not looking for kingdom enlightenment to make us wealthy. If that happens, that's great. But guess what? We're not looking for it. We're positioning ourselves with a business, doing other things. I have books that I'm writing, other things outside of that. So we're, you know, we're not looking for that. We're just using what's in our hands. I have an anointing oil business and I have different things. I'm just do what I gotta do, right? <laughs> My husband's still working and God has been faithful. And so we know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. So we're like, God, however, you know, speaking engagements, workshops, whatever God wants us to do, that'll be for us. But everything for kingdom enlightenment is for kingdom enlightenment. It's a nonprofit organization. And we don't get paid by it because we don't have enough money to get paid by it. So we don't worry about that. We just do what we got to do. And when we when we do, our board of directors will work that out. But even then, you know, you hear about Joel Osteen. People freak out about his house. That house is paid by, by, by his books. He actually doesn't even get a salary. And he has every right to get a salary. I'm not saying that I'm a Joel Osteen follower. But I'm just saying, if you labor for the gospel, the word of God says you should receive. But I'm not going to be a wolf and try to exact the money out of people and, and manipulate them. I'm going to trust God. If I trust God, then I should trust him with that and not manipulate people and hold uh, special. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I'm just saying sometimes you see that. <laughs> so anyway, here's a way to unlock. I try. I know I can be very black and white and very matter of fact about things when I know I need to season my works with grace and honor and love and stuff like that. But, <laughs> so not get into anything that God hasn't told me to talk about, so I take that back. <laughs> Just happens sometimes. And it's not special if it happens every month. So I'm saying, you see, you know, even on TV, there's, um, there's a pastor. I used to love him in the 90s, but now when I see him, it's like, you're going to wait till Pentecost come around so you can get a Pentecost offering. You gonna wait till this and that happens. You can, it's not a special offering if it happens every month. It's not special no more. 
you probably need to downsize, dude, if you stress out over money. Yeah. So if you feel like you got to manipulate you, that's all I'm saying. Loved him because he was a justice warrior. He was after partial birth abortions in the 90s. If I said his name, you would know him. And demons, I know demons have trembled when they saw him, at least definitely in the 90s. Now, I don't really know what his walk is like because I don't see him that much. All the, Every time I see him, it's, a, it's another angle for money, which lets me know somewhere along the way, this man of God has lost his trust in the Lord to where he feels like he has to do that. So if y'all ever see us doing it, y'all charge us up. I'm saying it on I'm saying it on TV. Y'all charge us up. Like, look, I think you kind of <laughs> you know, and we'll just be like this. Look, we're running short this we don't have that kind those kind of bills, but look, we're running short this month. Just let the people know. I'm not gonna come and give you a, a hundred dollar line. <laughs> Prophesy to you when you come and get it. You see that? So I've seen that. People give more if they think you're gonna get a prophecy. I wouldn't think you're giving this since they're giving prophecies in the in the line. I'm gonna go out there and get my five dollars so I can get a prophecy. Just saying. There's game. There's everybody's everybody's not running game, okay? Everybody's not running game, but some are. And let's just be real about it. I'm not gonna back down from that. Um, yeah. So what is a glory carrier? We just talked about that, didn't we? <laughs> so why do you have alignments in tribes? Why do we have alignments in tribes? And we're gonna wrap it up. Why do we have alignments in tribes? I know. You're doing good, mama. <laughs> so why do we have alignments in tribes? Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, and I'll just read it to you. And it's a familiar scripture. And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists. He gave some apostles, prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I'm not saying everybody is fivefold, but some are, right? Because he gave some, some and some. <laughs> Why did he give them? For the equipping of the saints. That word equipping is derived from the root word. I'm going to say it in my Texas accent the best way I can. Ketartizo. Uh, <laughs> Ketartizo. I think I said it right. And it, it comes from a word that is, that is a derivative of another word that means complete and thorough. So if you put all that together, um, it means to fit, to frame, it means to perfectly join together. So the word equipping at the root means to perfectly, completely join some things together, to restore, to repair. And um, so ba basically when the body is properly aligned, when the body is equipped like it should be, and it's properly aligned, the joints can effectively supply one another, mobilizing the body of Christ and advancing the kingdom. This is why the apostolic reformation is so important right now, which is the, the reformation and the move that we're in, because God wants to make sure that people are fitly joined together. So we don't have, we don't have a covering. I said it, we don't have a covering, but we are aligned. Because <laughs> I know some people will be like, you have no accountability. No, we have a lot of accountability. We're actually aligned with Becky Castle and we're, Ryan, we're aligned with Ryan Lestrange Ministries as of this past week. So we have those alignments and we have the accountability. But when you think of covering, what do you think of? Think of God. Sorry, no, I mean man, covering you. Like protection, overseeing. It could be protection, it could be overseeing. But what are some of the negative things that you think of when you control. think of covering? Control. Yeah. Everybody said control, okay. Control and what else? Manipulation, oh yeah, gift hoarding, wow. like a like you managing your gifts and not allowing the freedom. Mm -hmm. So there are some good things that come from it. There are some negative things that come from a covering situation. I am not knocking coverings. That is the best language that many have. So I know it's going to tick some people off. I guess I'm here to tick people off, not <laughs> not on purpose, but. I'm just going to say the way he gave it to me. So, But we believe in an alignment. That way people can move and do what they need to do in the body of Christ. They're fitly joined together so they're connected in a way that's not going to restrict their movement. The arm can be the arm and not just the arm that you want it to be. But I'm more interested in, in not just people building kingdom enlightenment, although God is going to bring people to build that. I'm interested in what is it inside of you that needs to be released in this earth because the kingdom of God needs to be built. And a lot of people have gifts and they have no idea what to do with them. In the month of April, we're going to be talking about nothing but gifts. We're going to go deep into it. We're going to have fun. 
<laughs> we're gonna have fun because I, I just rewrote my book and Anita, Lanita, we have Anita Tisdale. Lanita is editing it right now. So it's done. I already have the book, but I revised it and I expanded it because I wanted the things that showed up in workshops, the questions that people had. I want to make sure it was in the book because my book is actually going all over the world. I'm not saying that to make it sound, it's just because it's on Amazon, that's why. And Amazon opens up to different channels. So there are people in Japan, Australia, Canada, um, India, they've gotten my book. Well, those people may never hear me teach. I hope they do, but maybe they won't. And my book went to a Muslim country. I actually met the pastor and they needed to equip and train their people. I had a couple books, I just gave it to them. And there's a, somebody else with something similar like that happened. And they're like, thank you so much, you know, because they needed to equip their people. So like, here's, here's some things on gifts so you can help them because they're experiencing moves of God and they're believing women, women preachers and everything in this Muslim country. And they're completely going against the norm. I'm like, y'all need to know what to do with your gifts because they, you know, they're trying to figure it out. So it's gone into different places. And God, God did that because I was kind of scared. I'm like, but I just gave it to him. I gave him like three of them, three or four books. Like, here. <laughs> I was kind of scared too because I was like, oh, nobody. <laughs> I hope they don't be like, who wrote this book? <laughs> well, if she's in America. Leave her alone. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, and I'm not saying every Muslim country is, every Muslim is bad, I'm not saying. I just know that a lot of this is illegal in their country. So my book is contraband somewhere. <laughs> it is, <laughs> just like the Bible. Yeah. Kind of cool, huh? Street cred, street cred. <laughs> no, because it's going so many different places, I wanted to make sure the book had enough stuff in it to where if people never get a chance to meet me, that there's some things in there um, that I normally heard people ask. But I even got so basic to explain what is the anointing, what is impartation, what are these things, and it gives, and it's not just a simple little answer. It really gives you the spiritual, the spirit realm impact of those things. So you have a, a more complete, you have a more complete expression and understanding of it. So we do have alignments, and not only that, but out of this house we have other ministries, and they may have things going on, and we'll go and assist them and help them because maybe they need a prophetic gift. Um, or, for instance, there's one evangelistic type ministry. They're going into Alvin doing a lot of, I mean, they're apostolic and evangelistic, and they're going to Alvin doing a lot of stuff. So we may be like, hey, y'all want to come with us? Because we're going to go out there. We have a woman that interprets dreams, and she has a team. They'll go out there, and they just set up dream interpretation booths, just like John Paul Jackson used to do stuff like that. And uh, she reminds me of him. That's why. <laughs> I've always wanted to meet him, but the Lord gave me her, and I was like, yes. <laughs> yes, so she's awesome. But anyway, those are ways that people can partner, not just doing stuff within the church walls, but what can we do outside of the church walls? And I want to network different ministries so that people with giftings can go help do different things. So we'll, we may do stuff here, but please don't just do stuff here, unless that's all God called you to do. Um, but we want to be able to go and affect change. So there's some things that we have coming up I'm going to tell you about. So tribes, why have a tribe? And this is my last thing. Tribes are basically families. That And, and I'm not demonizing covering. Oh, I just told you all that. But we're just, okay, this is something important. I'm not demonizing the term covering. It served its purpose. I said that. But this is a time of exploring new language and establishing culture under the new wineskin. So that's why this new language is important. So here's the other part, tribes. Tribes are families that have specific attributes or an assigned purpose. So if you go to um, one place, they may be very prophetic tribe of people. Here, we're gonna be apostolic and prophetic strength teaching. Those are our strong giftings. Evangelistic is our heart because we want to birth evangelistic people and pastoral people and all those different things. So we want to we have like a holistic approach to the fivefold here. We want to raise up fivefold leaders. We want to raise up people that that maybe they're not fivefold, but in order to be a mature person, Ephesians four says you need an impartation from all five. So that all five need to be expressed in a body, and if, and those will be raised up. I mean, we just started a year ago. And really just emerged in January because we were just doing events last year. Actually established where we're open every Sunday, you know, unless there's a flood in Houston or a tornado, we'll be here. And we're upstairs. So how about that? <laughs> they didn't flood here. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway, so a tribe is going to be a group of people that have the same 
flavor, the same purposes, the same goals, their assigned purpose and attributes. The toxic version, what is the toxic version of a tribe? Um, I think it's going to be one still mindset, um, mm -hmm. abrasive to a tribe that you feel like this and feel like this. Exclusive. So it's religion, but now it's on a smaller scale, so it makes it, I, I keep hearing clickish. Clickish, um, yeah. yeah. That's one thing. On the extreme end, a tribe can also be, uh, a toxic tribe could be a cult. Mm -hmm. the, it's like the more restrictive it becomes, the more cultish it becomes. Mm -hmm. So it could be mm -hmm. religious, but if they restrict you to where you have to wear what they want you to wear, eat what they want you to sleep where and how, because that happened with the whole thing with Jim Jones years ago. There is a woman, like the mother of somebody that I know, who they're a lot older, they're in their 60s now, but their mother was a part of that. And they had to get permission for her to even come visit them. And when she did, and they got the permission, she had to, she slept on the floor. They're like, why are you sleeping on the floor? That's how she was told she had to sleep. Even when they weren't around, she's sleeping on the floor. So it's a cult is going to tell you what you got to do, how you got to do it, when you got to do it, what to eat, how to eat, all that kind of stuff. And as you loosen that up, it's just basically religion. And some people may not do all that kind of stuff, but the manipulation and the control, you see what I'm saying? That's all the religious spirit. It's a religious spirit, it's Jezebel spirit, and it's the Python spirit. They all come to steal anointing, but in three different ways. Matter of fact, Ryan LaShange, I hadn't read the book, um, and I need to, but it's called Hell's Toxic Trio. <laughs> and it comes after the church. That, that the, the Python spirit comes to restrict you and to literally, literally pull the power out of you, the strength out of you. The Python spirit does that. Religion does it in different ways by restricting your growth, controlling you, and Jezebel will just manipulate and control you. And Jezebel also, they all kind of come at prophecy a different way. Jezebel definitely has a false prophetic thing going on, as we saw in the Bible. Everybody that's controlling, manipulative is not a Jezebel. But Jezebel does grow up one day. For some people, they've been apprehended by the love of God so much that they never become a Jezebel. I've met people, I've known people like that. Well, I've seen where God protected them from becoming a full-blown Jezebel, but they had those tendencies, but they loved the Lord, and God loved them so much, God protected them and kept them from getting that bad. And I would see how God would never quite let them have their way and power or leadership sometimes. They didn't realize what was happening. I didn't realize it until later when he revealed it to me. But they didn't realize what was happening. He was actually protecting them because had they gotten that, it would have triggered something. They needed more deliverance before they got there, and they would have been powerful when they do that. But I'm just telling you, whenever you see that on people, a lot of times prophetic people say, they're a Jezebel. Never, ever say that unless God has told you that. Because sometimes it's just, we all have control and manipulative issues. It's, it's the nature of humanity. Eve, the whole basis of sin. I want to control my own life. I want to know good and evil apart from God. And this is the separation. This is Actually, that was... There's a lot of sin that came out of that, but one of the biggest ones was religion. Knowing God apart from God is religion. Mm -hmm. And I say it all the time, and I'm going to keep saying it all the time, because that's, a, that's one of the spirits that, that our very existence combats, religion, big time. So all of us have a religious nature in us because of the fall of man. So even though this doesn't feel religious, our own mindsets can slip us right back in there if we're not careful. If I start navigating this this ministry the way I think, and it looks progressive, but I ain't following God. I've done the same thing that Eve did, and I've fallen into religion. I'm just saying. Religion isn't always as covert as what we think. So, I'm done. What is the purpose of the anointing on your life? And we talked about that, being a glory carrier, allowing God to not just use you wherever you are, Minister to people freely, and I see, I see when when things are let go with you guys, y'all gonna be really fiery, both of you, very fiery, very fiery in your own unique expression. Where people may have looked at you and said that you um, are hard, or that you are, um, I'm gonna shut this down now. Love y'all. Bye bye. I'm doing some personal prophecy. See y'all. I don't want to say this one. <laughs>